when you isolate it and you ground your AI properly, then you can get better results. If you try and throw it at a massive data lake or you know, a data warehouse or something, you're just going to fall short. If you give a man a prompt, you'll get him to understand one answer. If you teach a man mm. to prompt, you'll get him to more. Exactly. AI. And it's, it's so basic, though, but it just takes practice. Like... <laughs> I thought that was the headline shot. Hello and welcome to another 10 ton potato. Today we are joined by, uh, by, we're not joined by, (laughs) hey man, Uh, we're joined uh, uh, on our show, Master of You All, uh, Philippe Morin. Uh, and Philippe has been a good friend of ours for many, many years. And uh, we were chatting to him um, about uh, joining up and chatting at Collab Days. And I said, hey, have you been on the show? Because uh, he's had an interesting career. Philippe has worked in uh, many industries, uh, automotive, um, telecommunication, all the big boys. Um, and he has done a lot in the ECM space, uh, records management, knowledge management, and knows it back uh, to front, as well as that he got some fantastic, crazy stories uh, about user adoption and uh, change management. And so, Phil, welcome Thanks to the so show. Much. I'm amazed Thank that you. you've done all of this and, uh, all the while since you've known me since you were about 12, right? Uh, 13. 13. Yeah. There's some history for you. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, Really we, so need, we need to I've, look. I've just learned that my co-host Craig Tarr um, um, had friends, <laughs> which I didn't know. Or acquaintances that you went to school with. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Uh, and then later business transactions. Yeah. But, uh, wow. Well, that's, uh, I'm, I'm very excited so, to break my podcast virginity with you guys. It's uh, yeah, pretty awesome. Wow, we've got an exclusive first mm-hmm. time ever. First time ever. Speaking to us exclusively on Ten Ton Potato, you know, you can be proud. I mean, not many people get to speak on Ten yeah, Ton Potato. Uh, but no, I went on to, uh, to Spotify to go and have a look at uh, what you guys have done. It was very cool. Yeah, we've, we've, had, some, we've had some good uh, mm. guests uh, over the past few months. So it's been, it's been incredibly fun just to catch up and chat. Oh, all, definitely. All, um, all the good things. On. And I think that the, the, oh, yeah? there's been a bit of a theme over the last couple of uh, weeks in that uh, we've been chatting with guys who are putting together or attending collab and uh, mm-hmm. hey Phil aren't you attending collab South Africa I am I'm <laughs> super pumped about it <laughs> all three <laughs> sittings just going to do two of them but tell me uh, tell me what's actually what is your session about what, so what are your main kind it, of points it's backing off the work that I've done over the past couple of years, um, that international work that you kind of described in the automotive industry, because what I found from a knowledge perspective, there's been this massive resurgence where 10, 11, 12 years ago, you would have had everybody SharePoint, SharePoint, you know, document management, documentum, open text, you know, we need to do knowledge management. And there was very little understanding as to exactly how to achieve it. And when I was engaged with um, the company in Sweden, what landed up happening was I had to re-instantiate or reinform the teams and coach them as to what knowledge management really was. And I realized with the insurgence of AI that there's a very big drive back towards knowledge management without people really knowing it, right? So for the collab days, and I can go into that in a little bit more detail, but through the learnings, I started to break down the contextual relationship between content and data and how to bring that to the fore for people to be able to make smarter, faster decisions, which is always what people start talking about. Oh, I need to make better decisions faster. And, you know, you know it's good for the business. Show me the yeah, data. Exactly. And when, when you deep dive and you look at it, I think most of those kind of projects are not necessarily stillborn, but consistently keep having to evolve because there's things that they learn along the way. And the way in which I approached and architected the solutions 
with the teams that I had on site. And they, they, they were all in-house teams, which was really, really interesting to work with as well. Um, was quite, in my opinion, quite ingenuitive, um, innovative in, in certain aspects, in certain ways. So, you know, I, I wanted to really bring that across in, in Collab Days, you know, share the learnings, share the the frameworks that I kind of created and what, and what really, really matters from a uh, informing, creation, managing, publishing and discovery sort of aspect. So, yeah, Collab Days for me is going to be fun. I did a, a similar presentation for Gibbs MBAs uh, a few weeks back. And, you know, that was fairly well received. So I'd like to uh, take another stab at it and make it better. Excellent. So you're going to be talking to us about security, right? Absolutely not. I know nothing about security. <laughs> that's, that's, that's for much smarter people. Well, we've, we've actually, uh, there are some security sessions, mm -hmm. so there, there, we have that covered, so don't, don't yeah. stress too much. But I want to go back to what you were saying uh, about the, the knowledge mm -hmm. management side of things. And what I found, and also kudos to you for framing your perfect client where you can go into a client because you work with internal teams. Mm -hmm. I saw that happening, well done. Um, um, there's two types of I find companies. It's the companies that have all the data and then spend a month putting it all together and then mm -hmm. presenting it. And then there's the companies that are a bit more mature that continuously can present on the data because of the way that they structure mm -hmm. it and uh, mm -hmm. capture it. And you're the person that comes in and says, cool guys, you're actually capturing all the data, you're just not putting it in the right way, shape or form. And if we do X, Y, and Z and we change certain uh, procedures and upgrade mm. certain systems, we can see that data yeah. all the time. I think that's the main kind of thing I've got from what yes, you're trying and. to Yes, So a, a lot of the time when people look at it, they look at it in isolation of only data and they don't realize that unstructured mm. content like documents, uh, spreadsheets, PDFs, et cetera, et cetera, also form part of a contextual relationship with that data. So what I've done is I've bridged the gap between both of them. So I've taken what you've just said and taking the data and putting it in such a way that people can more readily consume it, but providing additional context to that data. So for example, if we look at an order management system and an ERP system with bill of materials and contracts and CRM, all three of the four of those systems are related in some way or form. Right. And what I've started to do is say, OK, well, based on the contextual relationship, what do I show to who and when? And that's the really, really interesting thing, because if you think about knowledge management, it's not a product that you buy. It's not a solution that you build. It's the amalgamation of different disciplines that come together to create a way in which people engage with content. So for me, it's around digital content engagement and digital content transformation more than it is knowledge management, trying to sort of drive those ones home as sort of brands for me. But bridging that gap and allowing people to very quickly dive through, almost think of it as BI for unstructured content and really dive into what it is that they want faster and look at all the other things that have a knock-on effect. So if I choose this specific order, then for that order, these parts need to be done or, or need to be uh, in store. If they're not in the warehouse and the storage area, then they need to be ordered, which means this, this order is going to um, get pushed back, which means that this customer is going to be unhappy. Please phone this customer. So there's a whole chain of events that can happen if I have everything all in one place. And today I have not, not ever in 22 years seen a single customer that does that. Not once. So, so yeah. if, if, if we also think about KM, sorry, Brad, you want to say? I was just going to say that that, that, that falls part of uh, just in time. Yeah. Right? So it's a big thing that is that. So, yeah, it can, it's, I mean, if we look at it in the, in the case of automotive, definitely. Um, if we look at it, mm. I, I can apply the use case to so many different scenarios. We can take the, the thought process and the framework and apply it to bid management, for example. We can apply it to customer yeah. support. We can apply it to so many different areas. But yeah, that's just in time works. Um, what I wanted to add, though, and, and leading into the AI conversations a little bit later, is thinking of knowledge management. Knowledge management is the way in which people engage with content, right? With the insurgent of, or insurgence of generative AI, people without knowing it are changing their own behaviors 
in terms of asking a question and getting an answer, right? So why can't we do that inside an organization? Well, you see co-pilot and stuff busy getting driven. Um, people don't know how to write prompts. It's a serious problem. So the adoption curve yeah. is there's twofold. One, people get super excited about it and they start using it and they drip down because they're not getting what it is that they want. Two, the price. So people start implementing Copilot, et cetera, um, or the Salesforce version of, of Copilot, and they're not seeing that return because they don't know how to measure that return. They're not putting the right metrics against it. So it's, it's really interesting where people are engaging more with knowledge and yet inside the enterprise they aren't because they don't know how to. So that can bring us to a change management discussion as well. So, I mean, in terms of the framework you're discussing, because you very much are discussing a framework which can fit across any organization, irrespective of mm. what um, technology set they're using. It's more mm. the methodology with which we, we aggregate and then disseminate um, mm. information. Um, one of the big problems there, obviously, being the, the prompt, would, would there be a framework that would solve that problem? problem? Mm. Or are there tool sets that uh, can assist people? Because this is something that I hear in the market a lot. Oh, buddy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Prompt buddy. Great, great little add in for, for teams. If no one's seen it, I have um, not where seen essentially that. you can, you can share prompts amongst your organization, just depending on what type of tools you're utilizing and, uh, and improve uh, the experience. Hmm. No, I have not heard of prompt buddy. So the former part of your question around, you know, are there ways uh, to get the prompts instantiated? I think it would, would sum up what you said, but a lot of what I did in the framework is presenting or providing the the use case for what the first part of the solution, the informing part, actually needs to be. There, the prompts are actually coded in. You you use your AI in the back end, you prompt it, and you you hone those prompts over time. Right? The it'll go through informing creation and we're talking about content now creating the content based on how it's been informed managing that appropriately so what needs to be governed what doesn't need to be governed um sorry let me just kill this to investors yeah. uh actually yes they've got a live stream <laughs> thankfully um you know but the end part is the discovery right and the discovery has those 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 two ways of doing it it's the prompt it's being able to ask the question but it's also being able to know how to dive through your answers so that part i have not actually thought about in terms of how to make sure that people write the right questions um in the prototypes that i'm currently building what i've got in the search bar or at least the prompt bar is almost like a teaser as to how to write it, right? So um, mm. for me, they're the four T's, which would be, and please let me remember them now, um, tone, topic, uh, can't remember the other two for the life of me. Um, oh, yes, there you go. But there, there, there are four T's that you could typically follow. A tactic was another one, and then there's... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the fourth off the top of my head, but you know, if if they follow those, you know, let me know a, the tactic. What do I want to achieve out of it? What is the topic? Give me some background behind it. You know, uh, give me the tone, etc. If you frame that, that creates the prompt. You just got to ask it a question. Just give it, you know, some sort of context. If you give a man a prompt, you'll get him to understand one answer. If you teach a man mm. to prompt, you'll get him to master. Exactly. AI. And it's it's so basic though, but it just takes practice. Like <laughs> chop. <laughs> um, I, I thought that was the yeah, headline no, no, shot. I was good. like, do me like, frame that. I just put a fish underneath it. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting one. I think it's, it's such a big learning curve. And I think, um, while we're busy talking about this, I'm thinking of some interesting change management ways of going about how to get people more prompt ready and still benefit not only themselves, but a business. That's, I think if I had a pen around, I would write that down. I think also very important for you to write that down because that last T is starting to worry me. You, you would never you mm -hmm. figure it out before the end of the show, just spit it out. Um, so a big thing here is it actually doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you prompt. 
if the data going in is rubbish, the prompt coming back is going to be rubbish. Yeah. And so this is what I find in a lot of organizations. They're like, let's put it at our data. And we go, no problem. We can do leave policies mm. and uh, maternity policies and mm. all that kind of stuff. And they point it at their policies and then they ask a question and they get a response and they don't like it. And mm -hmm. they're like, what? Why is it mm. telling us that? And it's like, you've got three leave policies and two of them are out of date. Which one do you want Absolutely. us to use? And that, 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 that was the case of the Swedish company is, and, and kind of why I was mm. brought in from a KM uh, subject matter expert perspective is that, you know, agents. I didn't know IKEA made yeah, cars. I know, right? Like it's yeah, the yeah. iCar. No. That was really lame. Please edit that out. Uh, <laughs> wow. You can, it's him. I was going to go down a route of you could get it in a box and assemble it yourself. But yeah, but, no, there's yeah. so many different You really hit a rock bottom. And did and did you know, strange enough, in wow. Swedish to actually pronounce IKEA is IKEA. That's completely random. IKEA. Yeah, something yeah. new today. Yep. So that is the correct pronunciation. I, I, I watched the uh, a YouTube short on it mm -hmm. um, and it was the name of the town. I really think so. Something, something to that effect, it? I can't remember. But but to your point, sorry, on the content side, that is exactly the problem. So what I was brought in was to solve an issue of customer support. Um, and agents weren't using the knowledge management system that they had, which, to be fair, wasn't. It was literally just a repository of information, right? And they couldn't understand why. They had 4,000 knowledge articles, you know, they were solving the problems, etc. but agents just weren't coming back and using it. And there were so many technical issues behind it, like search didn't work because there were so many attachments, but the search didn't index the attachments. So most of the answers were there. Um, there was duplicated information. So when they did search, they got three articles that were the same um, and yet had slightly different you know, uh, information in them. Like for example, one article would have 92 kilowatt hours in terms of battery charging and the other one would have 91. Which one's correct? They didn't know right? Because they're, they're support agents. So it's, you throw generative AI at that and it's just going to get confused. So it's, that is, that is a challenging one. And that's where the informing engine actually comes in that I created was, um, how do you normalize that? And how do you make sure that you get the correct answers? Deduplicate, get your content right really fast and then move forward. But you can't do that. You're hundred percent. When, right. when you get that right, you can send it off to ChatGPT. The amount of times they send me the wrong PowerShell script because it no longer exists <laughs> drives me insane. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about especially coding. with uh, a new module. But okay, so I mean that's easily hmm. said. Fix the data. Uh, but how how do you how do you ensure that the data is correct in tons and tons of data? Like what, what goes into data is the hardest part. Um, what I tried to do in starting it off is steer away from massive sort of rows and columns of data, rather focus on a specific system. Like for example, order management, you know, that there's an order against mm -hmm. an order number against a customer ID, etc. You, you can follow that trail and you kind of certain that that information will be correct and that data will be correct. Um, in an ERP, you'll obviously have multiple different areas, but you want to focus it only on the use case. Um, in this instance would have been the um, bill of materials and it would have been production on the car, right? Because it was very, very isolated. Yeah. When you isolate it and you ground your AI properly, then you can get better results. If you try and throw it at a massive data lake, or you know, a data warehouse or something, you're just going to fall short. There's just there's no use case for it. I think each use case needs to have its own OKRs. Um, that's something that I actually learned while overseas, and something that we don't do in South Africa from a product management perspective is truly, truly understand how to architect our products, how to follow that through, how to drive OKRs. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting one, and and when you do that, then you you very properly isolate your systems what you want to achieve. It's yeah, that's good. So I like that because then if you're following one process, then obviously in terms of auditing the data, you don't have to you check every single line. You can take two or three percent of the entire 
the the all the uh, mm. points of data and two to three percent of it you can run through and go cool is that correct is mm. that correct is that correct and you can get some kind of feel if the data is mm. right and give a an economics kind of view and saying yep i've checked it it's yeah. pretty sure that the rest will follow that pattern what's the percentage craig didn't you do eco uh generally you, you go with the 80 20 rule that's going yeah. to be my answer for anything economics you, wise. <laughs> yeah, you just pulled it up. there's a there's a percentage there so there's something if you if you do data, principle. i think it's around five hmm. percent what is it it's um five percent yeah that errors, acceptable variance that yeah they use that in yeah. manufacturing as well it's, so when we're uh, building up a, a machine learning model, generally we'll take about 15% of the data, put that into a test uh, model, and then use 75% mm -hmm. to build, and then 15% to to just uh, confirm any um, mm. uh, any hypothesis that we might make. Yeah. And it's quite easy to yeah set that up and run through it and, and then check the data. So I love that. So when we're structuring our data, rather look at the business process that you're kind of following through, take it from mm. point to point, and then just mm. take that mm. data. And then you're going to re, re you're going to rinse and repeat that process for Correct. the other areas. And, and you'll find process. that that'll actually clean up your data. It'll inform your capturing processes. It'll show you where your gaps are to a large extent. Um, if you do it right, if you have the right teams. And unfortunately, what I found is that here in South Africa, it's very different to the UK and, and internationally because we, we've just got different mindsets um, from a ownership or custodianship of, of data and, you know, where the sovereignty lies inside an organization and stuff. So it's you know, people get a little bit testy if you question them or you, you challenge them on the quality of something. So, yeah. I think you're just talking about South African, <laughs> South African businesses uh, are as 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 concerned with their data than UK. And being here, I can assure you, and being in the US, um, I've noticed that uh, the, the top 500 companies, especially the ones that we deal with, are definitely concerned about their data and, and the validity of it and being able to access it in the right way. The South African government, maybe no, not so much. Uh, that's where you can make it. is a fabulous number. Yeah. No, yeah. I, but I think it's more the willingness to change, the willingness to make a difference in order to be more compliant, to be to get the cleaner data, to be better, because they're, they're also willing to spend the money. Because it's not it's not cheap. Yeah. And I, I think you're talking about the NL Craig. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that they and they kind of lump AI into one big bucket, and they don't realize that you know you can. Bring, you can make a generative AI, there's NLP, and there's machine learning, just to name a few of the main sort of areas in AI. And ML is very data orientated, very, very much, whereas NLP and generative AI are more content focused. So, you know, it's around now, what does that choreography look like with the different AIs? Because you can't approach them identically. That's it's a different kind of spectrum of, of skill sets that are required. In my opinion. Most yeah. and, and I think yeah, if you're and, talking machine learning, it's, you always need a very specific use case that you're mm -hmm. trying to solve some problem. Um, yeah. Whereas the, the generative, you can come up with all sorts of trends and uh, analysis that you might not even have, have thought about, whereas mm -hmm. the machine learning very, very um, structured. Yeah. Look, the, the big thing now is, is obviously what can happen out the box with Copilot. Mm -hmm. So you can point it at data and go, Tell me about this and then you can do like an auto copilot where you go fetch this information mm. post it here and then on based on any responses mm. respond mm. right and that's kind of that's kind of where things get get yeah. clever um but it, again it, you have to point it at the data and know that that data set is 100 yes. percent um and otherwise right from the beginning everything is just mm. going to be spoiled and so that's when it mm -hmm. hallucinates. Hallucination doesn't happen on your corporate environment. It's your yeah. data that you're mm. poisoning the exactly. AI with. So it's 100% get mm. that data right. And it's, yeah, that is a challenge on its own right. But I mean, I love the second wave of what Microsoft are doing with Copilot. I think it's great. Jared Spataro is, is, is awesome. But the reality is, as we've seen in, all the organizations is that 
not all your content will sit in SharePoint. That's, I mean, invariably it becomes a glorified online file share if it's not used properly. And people will always go back to storing stuff in, on their desktop and in different systems, etc. So as good as Copilot could be, when you point it only at a SharePoint library or only at certain content, it's very Microsoft orientated. So it's cool. I think it'll work very nicely for SMEs. Um, chatting to some of the big four internationally in, in, in the UK, they are seeing big trends in terms of adoption because AI is too expensive. I think I said that right in the beginning. Um, so, you know, you'll implement something like Copilot. Is it too expensive or is it just expensive? Because people are still buying it. They're still it, buying right? it, but then they they're stop. That's, that's the trend that they're seeing. So people will buy it because they're getting excited about it and they see this opportunity or whatever it might be, but they may run it for six months or a year. And then they're like, you know what, this is not adding the value that we thought it would add. So, so do you think it's a bubble? I don't think it's a bubble. I just think it is people try to do it. In so what's, what's going to happen then? So we, they're buying it and then mm. they're stopping. And then that for me is a bubble, right? Because you don't have any long term retention. Yeah. Okay. What do you think will be the difference for the retention? So of the it would. Oh, and today on Ten Ton mm. Potato, Bradley roasts Philippe Morin on is it a bubble um, or not? I think bah, we, bah, we, bah. we need to look at because you just described a bubble, right? I, I assume so. I assume so. Not. I, I don't yeah. think I've ever termed anything a bubble. So I'm going to take your lead in terms of what that's defined as. Um, if I look at it, there's a hype, and we've got to see actual mm. kind of using uh, usable kind mm. of insights. Mm. Otherwise, yeah. it's a hype. And it, and the thing is, I kind of feel defensive about AI, so I think my natural mm. knee jerk reaction is going, "No, it's not a bubble." Um, but I suppose when you look at an isolation of what people are doing, it is it, it's turning into a bubble because people don't know how to use it properly or they, or they are trying to do it themselves without the people that actually know what they're doing and then they're not seeing the value. So, I mean, Craig knows I always use this equation, which is um, value equals benefit divided by cost. If the benefit is sitting at you know X and your cost is too high, then the value side of the equation drops, right? And, and that's, that's your bubble. There you go. The value is dropping uh, for customers because they're not seeing the benefit. So, I think, and that's because you're throwing people yep. at AI, going, "Hey, it's AI. Exactly. How hard can it be?" Yeah. But it's just like any mm -hmm. other tech. You can't just throw it against the wall and see. Exactly. You've got sticks. You've got to actually get your mm -hmm. data right. You've got to understand the business process, and you've got to understand mm -hmm. the outcome, and then put yeah. it all. Together. And of course, that term that uh, Philippe keeps bringing up is change management so i think yeah, yeah. Uh, getting yeah. people who are using it yeah. actually involved and understanding mm -hmm. exactly what they they need to do um, otherwise yeah. they're not going to see the value because there's this huge amount of pressure for mm -hmm. everyone everyone's saying just get ai otherwise we're going to mm -hmm. fall behind so they're getting it they're not they're trying to use it it doesn't work because they haven't done the exact thing that everyone say mm -hmm. you have to do get some experts in get your data right figure out a business mm -hmm. process that it's going to work with Put it all together. Do some change control. No. They don't do any of that. They just go, Copilot, make me money. Yeah. And Copilot goes, start yeah. a blog. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah, no, Craig, you, it's, yeah, it's definitely a great segue into that side is, is the user adoption. How do you avoid bursting that bubble and letting it get bigger, I suppose? Um, I mean, that, that, that example, Brad, that you, that you mentioned, it actually, it can it wouldn't work in this instance, but it's nice to be able to think of that sort of incentive based change management that not only benefits the end user, but also benefits the business, right? So I, I don't know if you would like me to regale that story once again, but um, the my, my feeling around this is if you can garner involvement from as many people in your organization as possible to almost challenge them to, you know, your best prompts to ask for this, go, you know, and the first top 100 prompts that come in, go into a draw for an iPad or something stupid like that, right? So the benefit to the organization is A, 
we can start to see what people are actually asking for, which will then inform new business cases for solutions that we may potentially need or how to unlock certain types of content. So there's a completely different benefit that you're going to be getting out of that for one, which is usually valuable to the business. The second part is, okay, cool. Maybe I should automate a lot of these prompts because 60% of them are almost identical. Cool. So we can wrap that. Then we can give feedback back to the end users because you're going, well done, great stuff. Here are the prompts that really worked. So now you're starting to inform them, but also inform them why. So as soon as a user or anybody understands why they are doing something, they have a greater propensity to adopt that. So I think that it's, Absolutely. yeah, I think that that'll be the approach that I would take. Um, it, it, it is quite a big change, uh, sort of communications campaign as well that needs to be planned out. And that's something that I've learned is that change management is not just training, it's around a whole discipline in terms of comms. It's a marketing sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Journey that you kind of go through. I mean, what you just said there for me resonated because one of the sayings that I always go with, uh, or always say to the team is, I'll tell you how, how you're failing when you can't show me the incentive to succeed. Mm. And if you don't have any incentive to hit certain targets or make a change or complete something, it probably won't mm, happen. Exactly. You know, people don't wake up with your agenda mm. in their head in the morning and go, this is yep. what I'm going to do. So in, I love that. You know, um, have a whole, put Prompt Buddy out there. I think we did a thing on Prompt Buddy. Mm. Put it up there, put it on Teams and say, guys, in our business processes today, add your best prompt uh, and stand a chance at winning a Iron Man Lego shield. No, no, no. no. Yep. Captain America. I've seen that Lego one. Shield. My, my son That's is one obsessed one. with it. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. It's going to be at one of the collab days oh, my as goodness. a prize. Yeah, but speakers can't, can't, uh, can't win prizes, happy. can they? No, of course Excellent. they can. Why not? Speakers give up Community their time day. to be at the events, and it's 100% can win those prizes. They're not paid to be there, so if they win a prize, awesome. they win a prize. Um, but yeah. The idea is best, uh, best um, um, absolute uh, mm -hmm. prompt wins this. And I think people will then start to use it. So then you yeah. win twice, right? Someone might win, but everyone's starting to use the product, which actually benefits yeah. everyone at the end of the day. So, yeah, I like mm -hmm. that incentive. And it's, it's oh, This session has been filled with nuggets. Good, I'm loving it. Good. Okay, it also sort of allows me to streamline my positioning and actually be able to regurgitate this stuff again and again and again in a better way. So uh, I'm, I'm benefiting from it. So, hmm. Phil, so, Phil, if someone wanted to get hold of you, how could they uh, get so it? So LinkedIn is probably the easiest. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn mm -hmm. in terms of you know just messaging people, people getting in touch with me. Otherwise, you can email me on philippe at rebootsolutions.net. Um, we can okay. sort of drop that into the um, into the podcast somewhere as to how to spell my name because everybody's going to do yeah, it. Yeah, like yeah. We'll, we'll throw it in the description and we'll mention you. And but and yeah, most yeah. importantly, you come, and, come and watch you speaking in uh, well, Cape Town during collab days. I'm going to be there. Well done, Craig. I was trying to open Thank the door Craig. there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It's... Uh, yeah, Excellent. I'm really, really excited to do those. It's, it'll be fun doing sort of guest speaking slots again. I haven't done them for a couple of years. Yeah, and we appreciate having you. It's, it's always, uh, I think anyone that um, gets a chance to come see Phil, it's going to be completely worth your while. The stories are incredible. The experience is insane. Uh, and you get it all. Yay. So, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a great experience. I really, really enjoyed this. It's always fun chatting and really. And if you look under your week. chair, there's nothing there. <laughs> you almost had me going, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fairness, I will give you a gift. Uh, we will give it oh, to you at Days. Uh, Michael Noll was on the show, show and um, I got him built on. Um, I found a place in UK that I think does excellent built on, and I saw him at Claire Days Bletchley Park okay. last week, and he was over the moon. And so. I think we've started something there, so I'll definitely nice, get to man. Nice, man. Nice. Are you going to be in South Africa for them? Not this year, um, but I will be there. Cool. Sorry, you're just going to have to put up with me. Uh, don't worry, we can cuddle. Great. Right. 
<laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Awkward. 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 Make it. I make everything awkward. It's my special talent. Oh, wonderful. Awkward hugs all around. Cool beans, guys. Fantastic. Philippe Morin from Reboot Solutions. Thank really you so much. It. Great talk. Let me see you. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, 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 -bye.